Hi there, Pastor Martin Nelson here from Plains Evangelical Church. Glad you could join us for another church online. We're in Matthew chapter 25, verses 31 to 46 today, uh, looking at the final part of Jesus' final sermon. If you've got a Bible, please turn with me to Matthew chapter 25, verses 31 to 46. If you don't have a Bible, Google it. Uh, alternatively, if you would like one, email us, pastor at plainsevangelicalchurch.com. We'd love to send you one or get you help on how to get one. And so follow with me here in Matthew chapter 25, verses 31 to 46. When the Son of Man comes in all his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit in his glorious throne. Before him will be gathered all the nations, and he will separate people from one another, as a shepherd separates the goats from the sheep. And he will place the sheep on his right, but the goats he will place on his left. The king will say to those in his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me a drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you? or thirsty and gave you a drink? When did we see a stranger and welcome you, or naked and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king answered them, Truly I say to you, as you did this to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it for me. Then he said to those on his left, Depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me no food, I was thirsty and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger and you did not welcome me. Naked and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison and you did not visit me. Then they will also answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister to you? Then he will answer them saying, Truly I say to you, as you did not do it for the least of these, you did not do it for me. And all these will go away into the eternal punishment, but the righteous into an eternal life. A TV talent show judge was fermed for when she came on stage showing her forearm displaying a tattoo saying, Only God will judge me. This is a phrase that many people have uttered, usually when, they're que when their behaviour is being questioned or challenged, or when they're rebelling against authority. But it's also a phrase that's been used somewhat flippantly. What does it really mean for God to judge us? Do we really recognise that he will? And what are we doing in light of that? These are some of the questions that I want us to consider as we look at God's word today. So, so far we've seen how God will judge the nation of Israel. Elsewhere in scripture we have a description of an event that will take place when God will judge the church. Last time we looked at how Jesus, speaking of the timing of his return, that this would happen at the end of a seven year period of tribulation for Israel. The purpose for his return is in our passage today. Matthew goes on to describe this final judgment of the world before Jesus begins the task of establishing a new and perfect creation. Now this isn't merely something in the future that we need to be informed about. This is something that should transform our lives today. So let's look at how we can respond to God's word for us today. First of all, let's look at the setting of the judgment. The who. The who continues on from last week. The second coming of Jesus to earth. It's a time where there will be no silent night. Where there will be no preaching or invitation to respond. Jesus' second coming, unlike his first, is to judge the earth and how they responded to his first coming. His first coming was as a saviour. His second coming will be as a judge. Matthew calls Jesus the son of man in his account of this teaching. This is the most common title for Jesus in the Bible. It demonstrates the fact that you recognise Jesus' identity in his first coming. When he came to earth as a man, to identify with mankind, to sacrifice his human body to death as a substitution for our sins. 
to pay the price for our sin that we might trust in him and receive his salvation, salvation from God's judgment. In addition, this phrase, the son of man, it was a less offensive phrase to the Jews when describing Jesus than, for example, the son of God or the king of the Jews. All three of these titles describe Jesus equally and none dilute his, ident his identity. But in referring to him as the son of man, Jesus has taken a much more softer approach with the Jews so that they might turn to God through him, not be a barrier be put up through being offended by a phrase. Now sometimes this is something that we can learn as we share the gospel with other people. Sometimes when we share the gospel, we need to be careful in our approach. We cannot simply default to the phrase, the gospel offends, and think that because we've offended someone, then we've done a good job. We must share the whole Christ, that's true. The whole Christ as described to us in the Bible. But in the same respect, there are certain ways in which we can reveal Christ to others, ways in which are much more inviting. For example, if we were to focus on a particular subject of Christ's person that is offensive to a person or just gets them angry, then we can close the door to them accepting Christ completely. However, if we counteract those negative feelings with equally true positive teachings about Christ, then the person will become much more open to hearing more. And now it's not that we have to hide parts of Christ's character, but it's just the way in which we enter into discussion. We need to be careful that we don't throw up a barrier so that we offend people in such a way that they turn their back completely. So that's a lesson for us on how we share Christ with others. That's the who. What about the when? Well, we looked at the subject of the when before and we saw how Jesus said that only God the Father knows the when of Jesus' return. The concern for us is how to transform our lives now in light of the fact that we don't know when and that we must look out for certain signs that will confirm when he comes. And one of the signs that he mentions is that at the end of the seven year tribulation period, when he returns, he'll come with an army of angels. So this will be no one man band. When Jesus comes, we will know all about it. He confirms again in verse 31, all the angels will be with him. Paul also writes to the Colossians that Jesus and the angels will be joined by all the saints, all the believers who have gone before. The Bible tells us that Jesus and all the angels and all the saints, that, sorry, that all the angels and all the saints will assist Jesus in the judgment of the nations. Now, we don't exactly know what this means or to what extent it'll happen, but this is another addition to the who category. But for now, back to the when. Matthew writes that this will all happen when Jesus comes in his glory. This can be determined by seven years, the seven years of tribulation, the appearance of an army of angels and believers and the, and the glory of God being visible on earth. So in Jesus' first coming, God appeared in human likeness. In Jesus' second coming, God will appear in all his glory. The glory of God is described in the Bible in various ways. The most common is in the form of an extreme light that the human eye cannot look at. God gave Moses a glimpse into his glory, but not in full. Then between the days of the tabernacle later on the temple and the days of the prophet Ezekiel, God's glory existed in the most holy place that only the high priest could go at a certain time of the year and in a very specific way. God's glory is his perfection on display for all to see. It's the presence of his in the presence of his glory that sin is judged. That's why Matthew describes the glory of God coming with Jesus at his second return. And just as fire refines gold, so does the glory of God judge humanity. And like with Moses, God has given us a limited view of his glory in seeing Jesus through his first coming. And through this, we can trust in his perfection so that when we come into his glorious presence, we will not be judged for our sin, but rather we will be saved through his righteousness. What about the where? 
When Jesus returns, he will return on his throne and he'll set up that throne on earth, more specifically in Jerusalem. And it's from that throne in Jerusalem that Jesus will judge all the nations. During the tribulation, we saw how Satan would set up a throne on earth as the Antichrist and he would call the world to turn from God. Now the real Christ has set up his throne on earth and from his throne will come his judgment. Psalm 9 verse 7 says that God has prepared his throne for judgment. Revelation chapter 20 describes the final judgment taking place before a great white throne. The colour white in the book of Revelation is the colour of God's righteousness. So it is God's righteous judgment. For those who die before that day, the judgment will be before the throne of God in heaven. This is the standard of the righteousness of Christ. Not that we might be perfect through our actions, because we can't, but that we might receive Christ's righteousness as a free gift and work it out in our lives that others might see Christ in us so that we will receive his good judgment on that day that will last for eternity. When Jesus' throne is on earth, the decisions will be made by Jesus and him alone. It will be too late to escape his judgment. There will be no final appeal. When the throne is in heaven, we can make the decision to follow him. Today we can turn to Jesus and trust in him. We can enter into a relationship with him by daily turning from our sin and trusting in his righteousness. But to whom has this been spoken about? Well, verse 32 tells us that before his throne will be gathered all the nations. So that seven year tribulation that God is dealing with the nation of Israel, it will be witnessed by all the nations of the world. And in seeing God's dealing with Israel, many from other nations across the world will turn to God in salvation. In addition, many within Israel will turn during this time to Christ. All the nations is everyone on earth at this point in time, both Jew and Gentile. It won't be a case of God will look at how the world is living at this time and judge us where we're at. He could do that from heaven. Jesus will gather everyone round his throne like a metal to a magnet and nobody will be without the opportunity to see that Christ is on his throne. Philippians says that every knee shall bow before the throne of God. Believers, unbelievers, Jews, Gentiles. Everyone will be forced to bow the knee and every life will be judged where it stands. Whether that's a previously acknowledged relationship with Christ or not, everyone will bow before the throne on that day. And again, on that day, it will be too late to turn. So what are we doing about it today? Are we turning to Christ? Are we putting him on the throne of our hearts? Are we living each day in his presence where we put sin to death and we live in the righteousness of Jesus Christ's first coming? Are we living each day as if that day is today? So that's the setting of the judgment of Christ. Let's now look at the judgment itself in terms of believers and unbelievers. The judgment of Jesus is described in Matthew is the great sorting of the saved and unsaved, the believers and the unbelievers. During the tribulation, there will be many Jews and Gentiles who will turn to Christ. At the end of that seven years, Jesus returns to sort out the saved from the unsaved. And Matthew uses pictorial language that this will be like a shepherd who sorts out the sheep from the goats at the end of the day. They graze together by day, but by night they eat and they sleep differently. Jesus, the good shepherd, will separate the saved from the unsaved and judge the two separately in the same way. So let's look at the judgment of the saved. The saved sheep are the ones that are placed at the shepherd's right hand. The place of honour, the place of obedience, the place of blessing. Jesus now changes his title from the son of man to the king. That reminds us that we have a king. That those who are saved are those who have lived their life with Jesus as their king. The king of their whole life. Not just the king of the religious area of their life, 
not just a religious label that they have adopted, but they have placed their whole life under the counsel and authority of Jesus, their king. He is on the throne of their hearts. All life choices are made in control of the king. All actions they make are under his authority and his direction. Maybe today you call yourself a Christian. But can you actually say that you are living as Christ, with Christ as your king? To say that Christ is your king is to pray daily the words of King David in the Old Testament. Search me, O God. Know my heart today. Test me and know my concerns. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. To say that Christ is your king is to listen to him when he reveals those offensive ways in your life and to desire to live in the way everlasting. What in your life would you be willing to sacrifice for your king today? If you can honestly answer that you would sacrifice everything for God, then he is truly your king. As well as having a king, we also have a kingdom. The believer will not know judgment in the same way as the unbeliever. Rather, instead of judgment, they'll know blessing. The blessing of the believer is the inheritance of the kingdom. The Bible speaks of our eternal life in God's perfect kingdom as an inheritance. God gave the kingdom to the Son as the Father gives an inheritance to his children. And when Christ, the king, when Christ is the king, whilst Christ is the king, he shares his kingdom with all who believe. It's not something that we earn through our actions. Like an inheritance, we only get it after there's a death. But Christ himself, he conquered death when he rose from the grave. God's love was not only demonstrated for us in the giving of his son over to death. It was also shown in the way he took the son's inheritance, divided it up and gave it to all who trust in him. So our inheritance is a life free from sin's presence and all its effects. It's eternal life in the presence of God. It's the life that we have dreamed of. Matthew writes that Jesus comes in his glory, on his glorious throne. That perfection that comes from God, that beauty of his holiness. His glory is our inheritance if we trust and obey in Christ. In verses 35 to 40, Jesus gives us some examples as to what that obedience looks like when he tells a parable. Summarised, it is about having compassion and serving others within the family of the church. Now, we also so show compassion and service out to others outside the church, to unbelievers, but in this instance, Jesus is talking about fellow believers. He uses this word brothers, which is often used when he's talking about Christian believers. This, To use a phrase that's been tossed around very much this week, we should level up within his church. We should give priority to those who are in need. We should eradicate any need within the family of God. And it's in these acts of service that we demonstrate to the unbelievers God's justice to the world. And if we put it this way, if we can't do that inside the church, then how on earth can we ever do it for the world? Jesus says that if we serve our fellow believers then we serve him. If you want to know how you can serve God today in your Christian life, phone a fellow Christian. Ask them how you can pray for them. Ask them how you can serve them. Ask them what their needs are and go out and fulfil those needs. Serve them with your life and pray for them. Next we have the judgment of the unsaved. The unsaved are described as the goats who are placed at the shepherd's left hand. That's the place of dishonour, rebellion and rejection. Jesus says that those who have turned their back on him, depart from me. One of the greatest sufferings of the unbeliever is eternal separation from God. Now that might not sound much of a deal just now, especially if you're not really that bothered about God. But when it happens, it will be the greatest suffering ever known. Luke records the parable of an unbeliever who is condemned to hell after death. And part of his suffering is he looks up and he sees those who have been saved and he sees God. 
he saw that he was the true salvation. He cries out to God for salvation, but it's too late. His salvation never comes. This is the true definition of hell. It's what Jesus experienced on the cross when he cried out, My God, why have you forsaken me? Why have you abandoned me? Now for us today, it's not too late. Salvation is available for us for th- and for those who we love. So don't leave it too late for accepting Christ. Don't leave it too late for sharing Christ. Jesus then goes on to highlight some of the other characteristics about this place called hell. Verse 41, he describes it as an eternal fire prepared for his angels. Some of the Jews believed that God created non-Jews as kindling for hell. Not so. God created hell for one purpose. Satan and his fallen angels who attempted to overthrow the throne of God. It's not God's desire to see any human being being thrown into into hell. Humans were made in God's image. Humans are God's creation. He's proud of them. He's really gutted that they have turned from him. So for God to throw any human being into hell would grieve him to the core. But in the same respect, God is a just God. And justice says that sin must be punished. So to that end, hell is used for an additional purpose, for those who reject the Creator. This isn't an easy message to hear, but it's reality. Jesus then goes on and repeats the same parable, but this time in reverse, showing how someone rejects him, who rejects him, is someone who has rejected his people. In other words, they've rejected that message of the Gospel. The unbeliever does not show favour to God's people, does not show favour to God's creation, to the nation of Israel, to the church, and therefore they do not show favour to God. In closing the passage and in turn closing the sermon, Jesus sums up the plight of the saved and the unsaved. He says that the unsaved will go away into an eternal punishment. Hell will not be a party with the devil and all unbelievers. It will be a place of solitary confinement, a place where even the wind burns every time it blows, a place of great suffering and regret. Worse still, it will be for eternity and you cannot escape it. That's a long time. On the other hand, the saved or the righteous, the righteous as Jesus calls them, because they have inherited the righteousness of Christ, will go into eternal life. A place where there is no more death, no more mourning, no more crying or pain. Better still, this will last for eternity. And that's a long time. So for the unbeliever, this world is as close to heaven as they will get. But for the believer, this world is as close to hell as they will get. We look forward to the day when we all get to heaven. When we see Jesus, what a day of rejoicing that will be.